Ever get that feeling? Like uh, the ground's shifting under your feet. Not literally, of course. Mm -hmm. More like when everything around you is changing so fast, it's, well, unsettling. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's where we're starting this duck dive, actually. Yeah. Europe, late 15th, early 16th century. Okay. The Reformation, new trade routes. It's a whole new world. Mm -hmm. And, well, not always in a good way. It's fascinating, isn't it, how... Um... When things feel chaotic, people crave explanations, something yeah. to, you know, make sense of the chaos. Right. And sadly, sometimes those explanations involve blaming someone else, right. which is where the witch hunts come in. Okay. We've got your research on this, a stack of historical accounts, even a look at how these events are portrayed in modern media. And let me tell you, the reality is far more complex and disturbing than any, you know, fictional witch's brew. Absolutely. It's uh, it's easy to dismiss the witch trials as just, you know, ignorance and superstition. Right. But it was a period of immense societal change. Yeah. Like you said, the Reformation. Huge E religious upheaval. For centuries, the church had been the ultimate authority, and suddenly people are questioning everything. So in this environment where, like, the very foundations of faith were being challenged. Yeah. Blaming the devil for society's ills must have felt almost comforting for some. Like, okay, that explains all the bad stuff. It's the devil's fault. Exactly. It provided a framework, a way to, you know, make sense of the inexplicable. And it's not like this was some fringe belief either. Oh. Even Jean Baudin, this leading scholar of law and government, right. even he wrote extensively about witches and demonology, oh. shows you how deeply intertwined these beliefs were with, like, everyday life at the time. It's so easy to look back and judge, but could you imagine living in that world right now. where these beliefs weren't just accepted but encouraged? Exactly. It's like how today we joke about, you know, bad luck or mercury in retrograde. Right. But back then, that bad luck could get you killed. Indeed. And to make matters worse, in 1487, a book came out called The Witch's Hammer, or Malleus Maleficarum in Latin. Okay, The Witch's Hammer. Got to admit, even the title kind of sends chills down my spine. Yeah. Not exactly beach reading material. No, not at all. So what was in it? It was written by a, a German monk, Heinrich Kramer. Okay. And it essentially became The Witch Hunter's Handbook. Oh, wow. It claimed to offer proof of witchcraft and advocated for, you know, the ruthless persecution of anyone suspected of it. So this one book managed to ignite centuries of fear and violence. It was incredibly influential, that's for sure. Kramer specifically targeted women in his writing, portraying them as uh, inherently susceptible to the devil's influence. He even went into graphic detail about their supposed evil deeds. His writing wouldn't get past an editor today, let's put it that way. Yeah. But these weren't just stories. They had a real-world impact. So who were these so-called witches that Kramer was so terrified of? Overwhelmingly, they were women, often older, widowed, living on the margins of society. Midwives were frequent targets, you know, because they dealt with life and death daily and with high infant mortality rates back then. Right. So when a baby tragically died, it must have been the midwife's fault, hmm. not, you know, just the lack of basic medical knowledge in those times. It's a classic example of scapegoating. When faced with something they didn't understand, they found someone to blame, someone vulnerable. And it wasn't just midwives, was it? Right. There are those chilling theories about women going through menopause being like somehow more susceptible to witchcraft. Yeah, it's uh, it's tragic, really. Yeah. These women, often seen as losing their you know, value to society because they can no longer bear children, right. became easy targets. Menopause, this totally natural biological process, twisted into evidence of something, well, sinister. It makes you question, like, the lengths people will go to when uh, grasping for explanations. Yeah, it really does. So it wasn't enough to control women's bodies and life. They were even targeted for what those bodies, you know, naturally did. It's a good point. It's a stark reminder of how fear and societal pressures can be weaponized, especially against, you know, most vulnerable. Precisely. And often the accusations stemmed from just like a deep misunderstanding of the natural world. Yeah. One example that highlights this is the case of Paula de Igluz, a healer in Spanish Cuba. Oh, right. Paula de Igluz. This is the one where the lines between like healer and witch get really blurry, right? Exactly. What happened there? So Paula was known for her healing abilities. She used traditional remedies. She even treated her master's illness. Wow. But then a child died and uh, fear took hold. She was accused of using supernatural means to cause the death. So if she could heal, she must also be able to, you know, right. to harm. Right. Was it truly witchcraft they feared or was it simply like 
knowledge they didn't understand. That's the question, isn't it? Like, oh, she knows how to use herbs and remedies. Must be in league with the devil. It's interesting. Paula's case is a powerful example of how the label of witch could be used by those in power. Yeah. If her skills were needed, she was a valued healer. But if she was inconvenient or if someone wanted to explain a tragedy they didn't understand, right. she could become a scapegoat labeled a witch. It's a chilling reminder that these accusations weren't always about, you know, genuine belief. Sometimes it was just about power, about controlling the narrative. Absolutely. But in Paula's case, there was at least a glimmer of hope, wasn't there? Yeah. She didn't meet the same fate as so many others accused of witchcraft. Thankfully, no. While she was initially sentenced to lashes and forced labor, she was spared execution because of public support. It seems that even in the midst of this, you know, widespread fear, some recognize the injustice of her situation. A small victory, but a victory nonetheless. Right. It's a reminder that even in, like, the darkest times, there were voices of reason. But if a book like The Witch's Hammer, with its fear-mongering and uh, dangerous rhetoric, was so influential, what finally turned the tide? What made people start to question these, you know, deeply ingrained beliefs. It's almost like escaping a kind of collective delusion, you know? Right. But what were the ingredients for that? What helped people break free? Well, it wasn't like a single event. It was more uh, a confluence of factors. But one of the biggest game changers was definitely the scientific revolution. So instead of attributing everything to the supernatural, people started, like, looking for answers in the natural world. Exactly. Think about Copernicus, Galileo. All right. Their discoveries challenged that long-held belief that the Earth was the center of the universe. Yeah. Suddenly, those old explanations weren't so convincing. Yeah. It's like once you understand how germs spread, you don't need to blame illness on someone, you know, casting a spell. Precisely. And it wasn't just astronomy. You had advancements in, like, medicine, biology, physics. Right. With each new discovery, the uh, the veil of superstition lifted a little bit more. Okay, so science is chipping away at the foundation of fear. But was that enough to end the witch hunts entirely? It played a huge role. But there were other factors, too, like the way people viewed religion was also changing. Okay. Moving away from that, you know, fire and brimstone image of a vengeful God. Yeah. People started to see God as, you know, more benevolent, more about love and forgiveness. So are we saying that, like, as the perceived power of the devil waned, so too did the need to blame witches for every misfortune. That's a big part of it. Plus, as Europe moves into the 1700s, things began to calm down, you know, socially and politically. After decades of upheaval, you had, like, the end of major plagues, some wars ending. Right. Stability doesn't need a scapegoat as much as uncertainty does. It's a chilling thought, isn't it? How fear and instability can create this perfect storm where innocent people are accused and punished for, you know, for simply existing. It's true. And in the case of the witch hunts, it was largely women who were targeted. Yeah. The witch hunts were about control as much as they were about fear. Control over, like, knowledge, control over women, control over a world in flux. Yeah. It's a reminder that throughout history, those seeking power often exploit, you know, fear and ignorance to achieve their aims. So where does that leave us today? Centuries removed from the witch hunts, are there still echoes of those times in the ways that... You know, we confront fear, uncertainty, and those uh, those different from us. That's the question we all have to grapple with. The witch hunts might seem like this distant horror, but the forces that fueled them, fear, intolerance, the urge to find scapegoats, those are still very much present in our world. It's about, like, recognizing those patterns, right? Yeah. Questioning the narratives we're fed and being willing to challenge those in power when they try to exploit fear for their own gain. Absolutely. It's about cultivating, you know, a healthy skepticism, a willingness to look beyond the surface and engage in critical thinking. Right. Just because something was believed centuries ago, or even if it's like a widely held belief today, doesn't make it true. Right. It all circles back to that feeling we started with, the ground shifting under our feet. Yeah. But this time, we're armed with knowledge, with a deeper understanding of the past, and hopefully with a commitment to you know, confronting fear and injustice wherever we find them. Well said. You know, we can't change the past, but we can learn from it and strive to create a future where fear and ignorance no longer hold sway. Absolutely. Thanks for uh, taking this deep dive with us. And for our listener, if you want to learn more about this period in history, check out the show notes where we've linked to some further readings and resources. Until next time, keep asking questions and never stop seeking the truth. <laughs>